All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is going to be fun. This yeah. is going to be great. So I, I, I had a whole page of my notes where I was going to introduce you to, but they already did it, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> Uh, Paula Kerger, President, CEO of PBS. Hey, 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 um, come on. President of the PBS Foundation. And one of the small number of women leading a major media organization. Yeah. Hey. The longest serving president and CEO in PBS history. Hey, wow, that's amazing. And Henry Lewis, Skip Gates Jr., director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, host and creator of a host of PBS films and series on history and more, including Finding Your Roots and the documentary we're going to talk about right now, Reconstruction America After the Civil War. He even did a book. I don't know how this guy does it. <laughs> he doesn't sleep. That's how. He That's does. exactly what it is. So I think we have a clip uh, that we're going to show to give you a taste of what you're going to see in April when this airs on PBS. So let's check out the clip, and then we will talk about Reconstruction. Great. On the evening of June 17, 2015, a stranger walked into an historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina, known as Mother Emanuel. He prayed with the Wednesday night Bible study group for almost an hour. Then he opened fire. We have nine victims, and I do believe this was a hate crime. Friends say the 21-year-old high school dropout was a loner, an unabashed racist with a deep hatred for black people. He just said, I have to do it. He said, you rape our women and you're taking over our country. The massacre in Charleston touched off not only a debate over the Confederate flag, but it touched off a debate all over the country. How did we get here and why is this happening? It was easy, I guess, to think of that as a singular horror. And it was convenient, I think, to think of it that way. Unless you really wanted to understand how this could happen. And then that meant that you had to get into the history. Most of us know that our country fought a civil war in the 1860s. But less is known about what came afterward. The chaotic, exhilarating, and ultimately devastating period known as Reconstruction. If we're looking for the roots of the tragedy at Mother Emanuel, this is where we have to start. The Reconstruction period is one of extraordinary excitement. The time in America could finally become that land of freedom that it had promised to be since the very beginning. Black people actually sat in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Poor whites and black people saw a common cause with one another. You're seeing this opportunity and imagining that will only get better. And looking back, what we know is those Black folks had no idea of the cliff that they were heading towards. The achievements of Reconstruction triggered a fearsome backlash, an onslaught of terror and oppression that lasted for decades. After 250 years of slavery, white Southerners could not quite accept the four million former slaves as equal members of their society. Violence is used in conjunction with Jim Crow in order to strip African Americans of the rights and privileges they gained during Reconstruction. The Charleston Massacre comes from a long history of white terror against African Americans. But Reconstruction left a legacy of hope as well as violence. We have to recognize the injustices that were inflicted, but we can't reduce all history to that injustice. People who had been held in perpetual bondage confronted the greatest sin of American history straight on. Their hopes were far greater than maybe what any government can accomplish. A system functioning without race being a barrier to equality, we still haven't quite gotten there. Almost a century and a half later, we still find ourselves haunted by the collapse of Reconstruction, a chapter of our history that's often been misrepresented and misunderstood. It's time that we acknowledge the true story and complete the work of reconstructing America. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> Thank you. So, Skip, I want to I want to start our discussion by thanking you for airing this in April, because as much as I love my Black History Month, <laughs> there's a sense that this is history, not right. just Black history, right? And that seems to be one of the major messages of this work that you've done. And you've also sort of called it um, a revolution that was sort of stilled, right? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about why you wanted to tell this story, and particularly this idea that it was a that it was a revolution that was kind of stillborn. Well, Dylan McGee is my partner on all of our films, and um, so we have a list. of so Paula would say from time to time, "What do you want to do over the next few years?" So everyone knows our franchise is Finding Your Roots, and I love doing Finding Your Roots. It just floats in my boat. You know, <laughs> I never get tired of Finding Your Roots. It grows every year, and my Intention doing Finding Your Roots is to break down barriers between us. We have so much hatred, so much division. And Finding Your Roots uh, has two messages subliminally every week. One, that we're all immigrants, even bl black people were unwilling immigrants, but we all came from someplace else, right? And secondly, no matter how different we look on the outside, on the inside, we're 99.99% the same. And I guess there's a final mess message, which is no matter what the laws were in the daytime about who you could sleep with, <laughs> when the lights came down, everybody was sleeping with everybody. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, so we had this list. So we have Finding Your Roots, season five's airing now, and we're filming season six. In fact, I was just telling Paula and Eric when I leave here tomorrow, I'll go to uh, uh, LA to film Melissa McCarthy. And I'm really excited, really excited about that. Um, but for our black history list, we had history of the black church, the great migration and reconstruction and the period that followed it is called the redemption. Then a funny thing happened in the presidential election. Hmm. Yeah. And I looked at this surprise result and then I listened to president Trump and things that he said, and this is, you know, we have Republicans and Democrats um, in, in Finding Your Roots. I'm an academic. I'm so glad to be here with my fellow academics. It's my day job, you know, with, with <laughs> teachers, because um, that's my primary identity. And I don't judge people on their, on their politics. But what I did notice was that President Trump said that he wanted systematically dis to dismantle many of the programs of his predecessors. And I went, holy mackerel. Any historian knows there's a historical precedent for this, right. and it's reconstruction followed by its rollback. Eight years of black freedom followed by an alt-right rollback, reconstruction, 12 years of black freedom between 1865 and 1877, followed by a severe alt-right rollback that was um, instituted with Ku Klux Klan terrorism. Right. And I thought, it would be a service to our country to tell that story, reverse the order on our list, because we were going to do great migration, mm. then we're going to do the black church, then we're going to do reconstruction. We flipped it to do reconstruction right now, and without being heavy-handed about it, <laughs> and without be being heavy-handed about it, we wanted to use this as a cautionary tale for where America is today. Because as Khalil Mohammed said, those people, you know, Reconstruction, imagine the energy and the excitement of people who had been enslaved for a quarter of a millennium mm -hmm. in the United States, right? Then all of a sudden, because of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, all of the freed men, because remember only men could vote, got the right to vote. Yeah. So that in the 10, 10 of the 11, former Confederate states, black men got the right to vote. And in the summer of 1867, I call it the first freedom summer, they registered those um, former slaves, 80%, ladies and gentlemen, 80% of all eligible black men in the former Confederacy registered to vote in the summer of 1867. That's at, unheard at great of. Personal risk. At and personal risk. In 1868, they voted. 
who won the general election? Ulysses S. Grant. How many votes did he win by? 300,000. How many black men voted for Grant? 500,000. Former slaves, illiterate, because remember, it was illegal to teach slaves to read, right? Mm. Former slaves, black men, by and large illiterate, elected a president of the United States. It was the what scholars call the second founding of the republic. Um, and, and the nightmare of... Uh, the former it was Confederate. Lincoln's in the Gettysburg Address, in the Gettysburg Address, said that the Civil War would lead to a new birth of freedom, and it was the nightmare for the former Confederates. And the South rose again. They said, "This is black power," in a way that was so shocking, so alarming, so surprising. They said, "The genie's out of the bottle. We have to put it we back in it back. through terrorism, through rape, through lynching." through peonage, through sharecropping, through convict leasing, and that's what they did. No, it was, no. there were 16 black men elected to Congress, including two senators in 12 years. There were 20 black men elected to the House of Representatives, plus two senators by 1901, and it would be, and then the last one was kicked out in 1901. It would be 28 more years before a black man came back uh, to the Congress. Mm. That's the story that we want to tell. We want to show that despite this, the constitutional revolution of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment, as you all know from Ava's documentary, finally abolished slavery. The 14th Equal Protection Clause and made established birthright citizenship. Yeah. And the 15th, that was the only way they could figure out how to make the slaves citizens. Said if you're born here, you're a citizen. And then the 15th in 1870, gave black men the right to vote. And guess what? Within 13 years, in the famous, the infamous Supreme Court civil rights case of 1883, they had rolled all that back. Mm. And right now, we are waiting for the Supreme Court to pronounce on affirmative action, the very same affirmative action that got a poor working class colored boy, as we would have said when I was applying to Yale, that got me into Yale University. So for me, not to be vigilant about protecting affirmative action, which got the women in this room, in this room, got the black people, the people of color in this room, in this room, would be to make me a hypocrite. And I'm not gonna be that kind of person. So, Paula, I imagine he answered this question already, but, but I'm gonna <laughs> ask you. He answered a number of questions. He answered a number. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm a per <laughs> just, thank you. Goodbye. No. I'm, a, um, I'm a professor. I talk in 50 minute blocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Paula, I want to ask, ask you, uh, from, from your standpoint, why did PBS want to do this? And in particular, why did PBS want to do this from the standpoint of providing educators with a way to talk about yeah. these issues? So, um, you know, obviously history is a tremendously important part of the work that we produce and distribute on an ongoing basis. And uh, we look uh, very carefully at stories that we think have a special meaning. We look at stories that are not well told. And it, you know, if you really start to dig in a little bit and look at reconstruction, um, you'll see that, you know, reflect back on your own education experience and, and what you were taught in Reconstruction. This, this film, which is four hours, uh, which will premiere on April 9th and air over two uh, consecutive Tuesday nights, is, is an extraordinary piece of work in part because of just the scope of the story, but also in the way that uh, Skip and Dylan continue to weave in references to the issues that we're wrestling with today. And I think to understand um, what is going on in this country right now and to be able to trace it back to, um, uh, to, its, to its seed, I think is, is tremendously important. And, uh, and so, you know, we purposely did not put this in February, as you, as you indicate, this is not, um, you know, we look at important American history stories of which this is, this is not uh, uh, a documentary um, that we put together just to put in a February broadcast schedule. Right. And I think that what will make this a powerful series and why we were so delighted that South by Southwest EDU invited us here is that I think this is a resource for teachers is gonna be profoundly important 
important. Teachers as a profession watch more public television than anyone else. And so you guys are people. people. You are our people. people. And I think beyond that, um, you know, for years I've I, I've been involved in public broadcasting now for a while. Skip <laughs> and I go back. We realized probably about twenty five years. Twenty five years of friendship. A friendship, um, usual friendship. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, that gets tested a bit. But um, show me the money, Paula. <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> but. Um, this is public broadcasting. There is no money. There, there is, is no a, money. But, but, but <laughs> the, the thing is, in, in, the, in the time that I've been in public broadcasting, look, I come from a family of teachers. I watched, I've watched teachers just labor to try to figure out how to, to bring our work into the classroom. Mm -hmm. and, and when I first got into this business, we used to broadcast stuff overnight. Teachers would tape it and then try to find the right pieces or they'd buy um, VHS tapes and try to figure out how to use it. We used to send out these beautiful posters that teachers would put in their classroom if we found the right teacher with the right material at the right time. And, you know, lo and behold, technology is caught up with our mission. So, right. um, you know, through broadband, we run a service called Learning Media, which we do through our local stations. Uh, we're local media, by the way. Uh, I don't run a network. I run really what is, in essence, a co-op of stations together. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that I have loved about working uh, particularly with, with Skip and particularly with projects like this is to figure out how we can take this four hour documentary series, which I hope you'll all watch, mm -hmm. um, and, and break it up into pieces correlated against curriculum that will make it easy for you all to bring the content into the classroom. So not all four hours of the documentary, but pieces of it all uh, with educational materials that, you know, that will help you really talk about issues that should be discussed in the classroom. So, um, and I think very much when I'm making a film, uh, particularly the black history films. Yeah. So if we have Finding Roots every year, every other year, we're doing a black history series. Yeah. And because I'm a teacher, because that's my day job, um, I'm, when we're making films, I'm thinking, how can this be used in the classroom? How can we use the middle school? How can it be used in high school and how can it be used in college? And I don't know about you all, or I don't know about you two, but well, let me ask you, what did you study about reconstruction? What about you were in what? school? Reconstruction. Did you study anything about reconstruction? Well, that's, that's, that leads to my next question, okay. which was, there you go. which was going to be that I think people have this sense in America that there's this, uh, progression, you know, civil war ends, freedom comes. Jim Crow happens, Jim Crow gets defeated, and it's this rise up for, right. for black folks. And there isn't this sense that there was a time right after the Civil War where black people had a lot of agency and success, and then it was all yanked back away from them, mm -hmm. which is what you know this documentary is about. And it's tough to watch. You know, I had, I, there were moments where I had the same feeling I had when I watched Roots or when I watched 12 Years a Slave, mm -hmm. where you know, because as a black person, you're seeing sort of the tragedy of your history unveiled in front of you. So um, that's my question to you. Like, what are these myths that we had about reconstruction and about the progression of black people in America that you wanted to challenge mm -hmm. in this film? Well, I think um, just to build on that for a second too, in the film, um, one of the, um, I think it's in the fourth hour is a whole description of how, the curriculum of how the Civil War was taught was purposely mm -hmm. changed mm -hmm. around under the banner of the lost cause. And so I, it made me really think very carefully. I grew up in Baltimore, uh, which is um, below the Mason-Dixon line. And I remember what I was taught and I just suddenly had this huge pang as I was watching the documentary and I thought, oh my God, you know, the understanding of what I had as a child was shifted and it was shifted purposely of how civil war and that was brought into the classroom. Mm -hmm. So um, some might call that fake news anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, in my class in my, I'm, um, I was in first grade in 1956, right? I'm 68. So <clears throat> when we studied the civil war or we studied American history, it would end with Lee's surrender to grant at Appomattox and the assassination of President Lincoln. And then really, it related to black people, it cut to Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. Correct. <laughs> you know? Correct. And it did. And there was nothing in between. 
And then when you got glimpses of reconstruction, it was a very embarrassing time when irresponsible, venal, um, lascivious, greedy, avaricious black men who were illiterate were given positions of authority in legislatures that they didn't deserve. And that all they wanted was to, um, the, there was a fam famous scene, it all comes from Birth of a Nation. We end with Woodrow Wilson screening of Birth of a Nation in 1915, because that film, it's not really about slavery, it's about reconstruction. You go back and look at it. Yep. And I screened it to my graduate class at, at Harvard in my first two sessions, because it's so hard to, for, to watch, and it's three hours long. Uh, there's that famous scene in the South Carolina legislature, by the way, in 1968, when those black men voted. South Carolina was a black state. Mississippi, Louisiana, and South Carolina were majority black states. People forget that. And South Carolina, um, the House of Representatives had a majority, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a scene in Birth of the Nation with all these black men taking a vote on a miscegenation bill. They have their feet up, they're eating watermelon and, and fried chicken. And then when they pass this, that they have the right to marry white women, they all jump up and down and cheer. And this is, this is how, th these were the seeds planted about why it was necessary for the Klan to rise again and to put the genie, as I, I said earlier, back in the bottle. Why it was crucial to take the right to vote away from black men. You want one statistic that you can take home with you and how effective these redemptionist state constitutional conventions were, they start in 1890 in Mississippi and they spread like wildfire throughout the former Confederacy. So in 1894 in Louisiana, 130,000 black men have the right to vote. 10 years later, 1904, 1,342 black men have the right to vote in the state of Louisiana. Hmm. Did they have voter ID laws back then? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they had an ID, if you had white skin, you had the right ID. <laughs> if you exactly. had black skin, you did. That was horrible. Yeah. They took away the right to vote. And it made me realize how powerful, black power really is the ballot. And that we want, I want this to be a clarion call for all of us to get our people to vote to believe in the system. Once you can see how much power we have, you know, all there are 42 million black men and women. And if we get black people to vote in, in, in the proportions that we should vote, we'll have a hell of a lot of power in, in this country. Yeah, if but voting people, wasn't powerful, we wouldn't have 150 years of people trying to keep it right. from us. Now, what's, what's interesting, <laughs> I wanted to, when I saw your um, section on blackface, I wanted to grab Megyn Kelly and put her in one of those clockwork orange suits <laughs> and, and make her watch it. Because what was interesting about the segment about blackface, and I'm interested in this idea of media being used to create images that then oppress people. Right. And the, the idea about blackface, the reason that we are trying to excise it from American culture is not that people get offended by it. It's that it was a mechanism to create this image of black people Right. That helped to disenfranchise. Absolutely. And, and you make that case so powerfully. Yeah, and that's why when Paula and I talked about this, I said, we can't do f just four hours on reconstruction. We have to do reconstruction and then the mirror, you know, the rollback. Right. Because they are part and parcel. In fact, that's how I was taught them at Yale. We had this great um, survey course in Afro-American history. First one, 1969, 1970. And... Uh, we studied Du Bois' book, Black Reconstruction, which refutes the myths of the Dunning School at Columbia about how um, these black men were basically ignoramuses. And then Rayford Logan, who was the second black man to get a PhD in history from Harvard after Du Bois, and who was a professor uh, at Howard, and who at one time was engaged to Letitia Gates, my great aunt, a little plug Whoa. for the family there, right? <laughs> and he wrote a book called The Betrayal of the Negro, which is about redemption. Mm -hmm. So from the time I was 19, I've thought of reconstruction in relationship to uh, its rollback. And one of the key things that we do, which hadn't been done before in relationship to reconstruction, is to talk about the, what we call the first social media war in the United States. And what, what were the constituents? A proliferation because 
of a technological innovation called chromolithography, which made it possible to print four color images cheaply hmm. starting in the 1890s. They could print hundreds of thousands of what we call Sambo images, hmm. black people with black skin, thick red lips, big white eyes, stealing chickens, eating watermelons, being eaten by alligators, um, every demeaning form of behavior and including a lot of sexual stuff, looking at white women, being lascivious. And you remember the, uh, the trope of Gus the Rapist in, which is the, the climax of, um, a birth of a birth nation. Of a nation yeah. And there were a lot of, um, books and representations of black men attempting to rape or fantasizing about raping white men. That's all starting in 1890. So this was, um, an attempt subliminally to change the image of black people in the United States, the image mm -hmm. of black people excelling and achieving that had manifested itself in the 12 years of reconstruction, right? So you had black men debating white men in, in Congress wow. and black men running state legislatures. So how do you erase that? You, you inundate the society with images of them as stupid, lazy, lying, um, you know, venal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that it was possible for a white middle class family to wake up from the time an alarm clock went off in the morning. So you hit the alarm clock, there'd be a Sambo image on it. You look down there, your bedroom slippers, you'd see uh, a Sambo looking back at you, you know, embroidered on your um, bedroom slippers. You take a shower if they had showers in 1890. I don't know, whatever, you know, so <laughs> um, you would go to your kitchen table, the tea cozy, the uh, napkin rings, the placemats. You go to work. You never see a black person at work, right? Yep. Then you come home. Your kids are playing a game, very popular game. What was it called? Trigger warning. Ten little niggers. One of the most popular games. You want your kid, you give your kids 25 cents to save. They put it in their jolly nigger bank. Man, the, the society went nuts. And they did it because black people had so much power. They did it because 80% of all the black community had the power to control those state legislatures for 12 years uh, in the South. And they wanted to, to erase it, to roll it back. And to what Paul alluded to, this was one of the biggest surprises uh, for me. Mildred Rutherford Lewis or Mildred Lewis Rutherford. You can do a fact check. I can't remember. And <laughs> she invented um, uh, textbook censorship. Yeah. This woman was a genius. She was the general historian for the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Right. And she issues this book on how to teach um, the Civil War. And it had 20 do's and don'ts. And the Civil War was not about slavery. Right. Mm -hmm. The slaves were not unhappy. <laughs> the Civil War was about two warring ways of life. Yeah. It was the war between the states. Mm -hmm. Do not buy or use a textbook that represents Jefferson Davis as a bad person or someone who defended slavery. Um, Abraham Lincoln did not want to end slavery. It is amazing, man. I reproduced this, or uh, Mildred Lewis Rutherford, that's her name. I reproduced this for my class. So the first textbook wars that we think were, are you know, manifesting themselves in Texas, or in California, over evolution, they were about the Civil War and Reconstruction. That's remarkable. The United Daughters of the Confederacy were geniuses at controlling the narrative. And you all know Brian Stevenson, the, the brilliant person who fights for death row, row uh, inmates and who started the lynching memorial um, in, in Montgomery. Um, uh, he says famously in an interview in Vox magazine in 1967, it wasn't the South, the North won the civil war, but the South won the narrative about the civil war. Exactly. And you know that by the, the 50th anniversary of the battle of Gettysburg, and you can read about this in one of David Blight's book, they reenacted it. They allowed no black people, no black, 200,000 black men fought for the North. Um, in the Navy and the Army, they wouldn't let one black reenactor come back after in 1913, right? Wow. So they all line up, the union, guys dressed in their union uniforms, um, 
guys dressed in their Confederate uniforms. They have the charge. And when they met in the battlefield, you know what they did? They threw their arms down, embraced each other, and cried and said, how could we have been so stupid as to fight each other to free these black people? Wow. That's cold, man. That is cold-blooded. That's so, cold-blooded. So now I want to ask both of you, um, you have this documentary that's filled with all this uh, great, these great facts that challenge these myths. These teachers are going to go into class and they're going to try and impart that knowledge to kids who've been told something very different by their parents, by their grandparents, and by their communities. How do they bring this truth to their students in a way that their students will hear it in a way that the, the schools will accept it? Well, you know, we, we have, it's a PBS series. I was just going to say, it's right? PBS. I mean, <laughs> that solves everything, it's PBS. <laughs> because nobody ever accuses PBS of being politically biased. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. No, but um, this is very important to me that I grew up in, a, in West Virginia. You know, that well-known center of black culture called West Virginia. <laughs> and we, we had a launch event at the New York Historic Society, New York Historical Society on Monday. Monday. And there were five women, Paula knows them, um, who always sit in the front row of all my events. And the thing that these five women have in common is that we met on the first day of first grade. Wow. The last day of August in 1956. And there are four white girls and a black girl, because I grew up in an Irish Italian paper mill town. And, you know, it was an overwhelmingly white area. And they told me um, the summer before the general election that Donald Trump was going to win, right? So I, I don't want to get into that, but I'm just saying that I don't, I think friendship and the pursuit of truth are beyond ideology, right? So when I look at, we have guests in Finding Your Roots. You know, some of my friends, I live at Harvard, which is the most liberal, one of the most liberal campuses in the world in one of the most liberal states, right? So a couple of weeks ago, who do we do? Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, and Tulsi Gabbard. Some of my friends said, have you lost your mind? You know, <laughs> you're doing these people. So I'm saying this just to say that we try to tell a nuanced, balanced story. You know, this is not me trying to redeem the Ku Klux Klan is well, noble and, effort. You know, I'm, not <laughs> saying, I'm not saying the, the story is biased. What I'm saying is these, these, these teachers will have to challenge the, the misconceptions that people may have held in as family lore. Right. And that's, yeah. that's difficult. So, 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 how, so what, what do they do? How do so they we do? have 44 historians, white, black, male, female, gay, straight, um, left and right in this series. So we built it around the testimony of the best historians about this period who don't even like each other, <laughs> um, you know? And um, also in, this is one time I've written two books, companion books. One is addressed to adolescents, my first adolescent book called Dark Sky Rising about reconstruction and Jim Crow. And then this book, which is going to be published by Random House Penguin next month, and it's called Stony the Road, which is from the Negro National Anthem, as we called it. I feel like Carol Merrill. <laughs> yeah, you're doing that well. Reconstruction, white supremacy, and, and the birth of Jim Crow. So there's enough in there to teach, quote, unquote, both sides. I think a great, I, I teach a lecture course at Harvard in which I teach the debates within the race that black people have themselves right. about um, I don't just say Booker T. Washington was an Uncle Tom. You know, I say this is Booker T. Washington and this is Frederick Douglass. Booker T. Washington, in the second paragraph of his infamous Atlanta exposition speech made in September 1895, Frederick Douglass dies in February of 1895, says the biggest mistake the Negro made was to pursue elective office before he was ready for it. Mm. And the last thing Frederick Douglass said before he died in his speech, Lessons of the Hour, was that black freedom was all about the ballot, all about the vote. Yeah. So um, I asked students, if you were been a black leader in 1895, what was more important, the right to vote or the right to have 40 acres and a mule? Because look at China, and you could, as the, I'm speaking to my fellow teachers, look at China, no political rights, huge economic boom. I went to China in 1892, there was a billion bicycles. I went back 2002, there were a billion BMWs. You know, <laughs> do you want to be rich or do you want to vote? You can set it up like that and make it a, a debate. 
You can have half the class. I did this in my seminar two weeks ago. I made half of the class defend Booker T. Washington. And I made the other half defend the right to vote. And that's a good lesson. That's a good exercise. So as an educator, I'm not trying to um, preach propaganda. I'm trying to get people to think. But when you realize that there were eight major massacres between 1866 and 1876, concluding with Hamburg, South Carolina, that the Klan was born, that the 13th Amendment was ratified December 6, 1865, and the, and the Ku Klux Klan was born late in 1865, and the lost cause narrative that reached its zenith, as Paula suggested, in the 1890s, was a book published by that title in 1866. So it was while black men were voting and this amazing revolution in interracial democracy in America was unfolding following the Civil War, so was this white supremacist rollback. And white supremacy is part and parcel of um, the way anti-black racism, which was created to justify slavery, rose and morphed after the end of the Civil War because of this astonishing manifestation and display of black power through the formerly enslaved. Okay, so that's what you tell people who complain. <laughs> so um, we've, had, we've had people uh, submit questions uh, online and then vote up the ones that they think are most interesting. So I'm gonna uh, read a few of those. I wanna start with this one from Anonymous. Right now it's second on the list. Uh, Many teachers are white, middle class, how do black students feel about learning this material from someone who doesn't look like them and they view as disconnected from their ancestors' history? Well, um, the fundamental premise of education is that all things are teachable, right? And that all things are learnable. I didn't have any black um, teachers in 12 years of public school except my typing teacher, Miss Hunter, in, mm. in the 10th grade. Um, when I went to Yale, my most important mentor was John Morton Blum, the great American historian, who was, we would say, was Jewish. And you know what he told me? I went to him my junior year and I said, um, Mr. Blum, at Yale, they didn't say doctor, but you could call people Mr. I had one female teacher, we called her Ms. or Miss, um, back in the days. And I said, what am I supposed to say when kids say, you got into Yale because of affirmative action? Now, let me be clear. The reason why I say this is the class in 66 at Yale had six black men to graduate. The class that entered with me in 1990, uh, 1969 had 96 black men and women. <laughs> so what was their genetic blip in the race? <laughs> All of a sudden, there are 90 smart black people who existed three years later, right? You know, affirmative action opened the door because Yale had a strict racist quota on the number of black people who could come. Class of 66 had six. The class of 65 had six. That was just the way it was. And you know who was in my class? Sheila Jackson Lee, a congresswoman from Houston. Uh, Kurt Schmoke, first black mayor of Baltimore. There was a nerdy guy, pre-med. You know, we used to see him at parties. He wouldn't talk much. He wore glasses. I always forget his name. Um, yeah, Ben Carson. <laughs> <laughs> but our mentors were overwhelmingly white. And they, they um, love this like everybody else. If somebody, the, the way I answer this question to my students is, um, well, I'll tell you what Mr. Blum said to me. So I said to him, what do I say if you just got in here because of affirmative action? You know what he said? He said, aren't you from West Virginia? I said, yeah. He said, that's why you got in here. <laughs> we, we needed regional distribution. <laughs> but um, if, if someone said that I couldn't teach Shakespeare, because I am not of primarily Anglo-Saxon descent, right. everybody in this room would say they were racist. Right. We have to say the same thing if somebody tries to say that if you're white, you do not have the right or the intelligence or the sensitivity to teach black studies or black history. Unless we fight that principle, the whole premise of education falls down and succumbs to white supremacy. It is racism in reverse. <laughs> Now, Paula, I don't want to put you on the spot, but as the white person on the panel, <laughs> uh, Paula, when you go white? to talk, when you is go she to, white? I, I know, I know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> She's so down. But um, 
No, she is. What are you laughing at? Why was that funny? Anyway. Have you had uh, a DNA test? You know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I did her DNA test. Yeah, and you won't give me the results. I won't give her the results. You won't give, oh, okay. I don't want to out her. He's, 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 he's holding back for a little more funding from viewers <laughs> like you. Anyway, um, when you go to have these kind of conversations. And there's a there's a ballot you all can fill out. Should uh, Skip Gates have more funding? For me? <laughs> you can fill that out, leave it in the box. It, the it's, it, put that on a check with a <laughs> donation to PBS. Anyway. Right. Um, how do you have these kind of conversations as a white person trying to talk honestly about these issues right. when there may be people out there who feel like, you know, I'm black and I, I know this issue better? Look, I, I think, you know, how we try to do our work at PBS is we bring a lot of people together mm. uh, to have conversation. I am deeply committed um, to having an organization that reflects the community that we serve. And we work with an extraordinary group of, of people within PBS. We work with an extraordinary number of talented filmmakers and educators uh, to put together what we hope will really reflect the kinds of stories that are not well told in our culture. And that is when people ask me, how do you decide what you put on public television? Because it trickles all the way through. It's mm. what stories do you tell? Right. Um, how do you think about um, the schedule that you're putting together and, and so forth? And, and you do that because we all have different experiences. Um, and it's, it doesn't just um, break out by, by color. It, you know, huge economic disparities in this country. People come from different places. Mm -hmm. And actually, Skip and I grew up not that far from each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our experiences, we have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. And I think that that's the way that we're able to um, do stories that are authentic, uh, that really get at the heart of, you know, what are the things that we should be engaging in as a society. And, you know, I'm very proud of this documentary. I'm glad that Skip um, called me one day and said, you know, I think we should shuffle this up and this should be the next project. Because again, I think that so often we are blind or uninformed of our past and we'll never get to the future that we all envision together without a true understanding of where we've come from. Amen. That makes sense. Amen. That's so now, that. Skip, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. Okay. Uh, because I want to try and get as many questions from the audience in as we can. Okay. So you will have to be brief. All right. Oh, yeah. oh, that's impossible. Can, can, can that is that? impossible. That's the one challenge that, that I might have stumped you on. Okay, great. So uh, first question from Joe Oliver. Olivier? How do you say your name, Joe? I don't know. Olivier? What parallels do you see between today's age and Reconstruction, specifically in terms of voter suppression, mass incarceration, and the politics of hate? Yes. <laughs> All right. Next question. <laughs> no, obviously, you, you hit the nail on the head. Each of those things happened in Reconstruction. Who's a citizen? Birtherism, right? Uh, voter suppression, the rollback of that number from 130,000 in 1894 to 1,342, through the trickery of poll tax, um, property rights, can you understand the Constitution? All these issues that we are that are plaguing us today are Reconstruction issues. So, absolutely, a plus. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do you feel from anonymous? What do you feel are the most common public misunderstandings regarding Reconstruction? That. Um, Black men were elected uh, to state office or to national office. There were 2,000 black men, 2,000 elected um, to various offices at the local, state, and national um, level uh, following the Civil War, and that they did a terrible job, that they weren't prepared, that they were inadequate, and that the South, the former Confederacy, through the Democratic Party at that time, had to rise again mm. um, and wipe out all these embarrassing mistakes. That is, as you know, Eric, black people have a way of saying, a, a joke, the Negro is not ready. <laughs> right. And right. that's what they said. They said, the Negro is not ready. And Booker, Booker T. Washington says it in that Atlanta exposition, exposition speech. Google it when you go home, you're back to your hotel room, and just read the second paragraph. He said, 
it was natural that we aspired to vote and to be elected to public office when we were not ready. What well, we need to do is develop ourselves as carpenters and, you know, um, plow uh, farmers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what, what I love about your work is that you show how these attitudes are not just the result of individual racist choices by people. They're part of a system designed to oppress people. Right. So when the Supreme Court makes its historically terrible decision to roll back, you know, these these gains that black people had made in terms of voting and not, you know, the idea that um, these civil rights acts didn't apply to p private spaces, mm -hmm. you know, yes. so 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 restaurants and and movie houses could segregate and trains and train. Right. Pub, you know, transportation. Um, this idea that this was part of a system. This wasn't just a corporation being racist. This wasn't just a restaurateur being racist. And when we see the Supreme Court, you know, reconsidering voter ID laws. Yes. Reconsidering affirmative, affirmative action. action yeah. Reconsidering all these things that we thought we had resolved in the public space, you know, decades ago. You, you get a sense of history repeating. It happened uh, when um, Khalil, Khalil Muhammad said, these people did not know they were heading toward a cliff. Do you know that there was so much opportunity in the former South, and particularly South Carolina, that when Richard T. Greener, the first black man, graduated from Harvard in 1870, where did he go? New York? Boston? He went to Charleston, South Carolina wow. to pursue his fortune. Wow. There was a black man who was elected to the Congress, gave an eloquent speech um, in defense, supporting the what became the Civil Rights Law of 1875. His name was Robert Brown Elliott. He was a black Briton. He came with the British Navy to Boston in 1867 and heard about all this um, activity, moved to Charleston, got a job at a newspaper owned by Reverend Richard Harvey Kane, mm. who was the minister at Mother Emanuel where Dylan Roof killed those people wow. and then ran for public office and was elected. He was a free Negro who came all the way from England just to be, that's what, that was, this was like a miracle wow. that black people formerly enslaved could vote and hold elective office. And they had to erase that. It's like a Stalinist, um, it's purge. like what happened, yeah. yeah purge. That it didn't happen, names were taken out of textbooks. Wow. This did not happen. Another anonymous, we are bad about, quote, teaching black history through the lens of things like To Kill a Mockingbird, which has a white hero. What better resources do you recommend? Now, bear in mind, you told me you like the movie Green Book, so. Yeah, I love Green Book. <laughs> I, I loved Green Book because I saw uh, two characters who um, mutually constituted each other, right? Mm -hmm. They both had an influence on each other. It wasn't like a dominant white man mm -hmm. and a subordinate black man. And it was two people figuring each other out and doing this dance, which is the only way we're going to have um, racial democracy and racial peace in America. If we realize there is no black America, there is no white America, there is no Hispanic America, paraphrasing um, Barack's brilliant speech when he was running for the Senate, there's only America. And that we have to define ourselves not through separate identities, but in relationship, in establishing relationships between our identities. We all have multiple identities. You know, you're not just Hispanic, you're not just black, you're not just straight, you're not just gay. You know, you're all those things. And we have to realize, it's what Kimberly Crenshaw uh, calls intersectionality, yep. that all these identities are in play at the same time and simultaneously. I, I ask my students, what do you want on your tombstone? Here lies a black man, here lies a black woman. No, you know, I'm a lot more than that. So that um, I like Green Book because it's relational. Mm. And I, I like to teach black history in relation to American history. Look at the subtitle of this series. We debated this, but it's called America after the Civil War, not Black America after the Civil War, because this is a story about America. This is a story about the past and the story about today. So in addition to Green Book, this, this educator is looking for alternatives to, to Kill a Mockingbird, which had a white hero. What you, you talked about a couple books that you uh, studied when you were coming. Well, up. I teach but black I, literature. Yeah, I teach um, African American survey course. I mean, there's I have edited with ten other 
editors of the Norton Anthology of African American Literature. All you have to do is buy it. I mean, it's in two volumes <laughs> of paperback. It's like 2,500 pages of blackness. <laughs> you can close your eyes and open it and just find the text. <laughs> but I think if you ask me for my short list, W.E.B. Frederick Douglass' Slave Narrative, 1845. Every educated person should read that. The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Anything by Toni Morrison. Um, the, the Color Purple uh, by Alice Walker. And, you know, write to me at Harvard. I can get you some more books. But, you know, you start with that. And, and I, I think that's good. Malcolm X's autobiography, indispensable. One of the great books of the American tradition. All right, and uh, I, I think this audience would probably kill me if I didn't get a finding your roots question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I, I did want to ask you, and we were talking about this a little bit backstage. I think one of the reasons why that show works so well is is you, your hosting style, your ability to connect with the person that you're talking to, and help them go through some very thorny, potentially thorny elements of their personal history. How'd you develop that style? How'd you bring it to finding your roots? And what is it about this show that seems to resonate with people that they're stopping you in the airports and hotel lobbies to talk to you about? This? Well, um, I'm just constructed. I like people. And I think, and I think it's a hard thing to fake. Um, people stop me all day now in a public place, ask for selfies. I'm always relieved because they used to ask for autographs, not that many, but <laughs> selfies are so much easier. All you gotta do is smile and put your arm, ask somebody, <laughs> can I put my arm around you? They go, yeah. They Look at the pictures, that. there's like two or three different kinds of smiles. Yeah. Really? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I love storytelling. And my father was a great storyteller. You know, I'm, I'm like uh, Elmer Fudd, the, 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 that's all folks, the next to my daddy. My daddy was funny. But didn't you tell me you studied hosts? You studied hosts? Yeah. And my mother, I gotta tell you this first. My mother used to write. This the obituaries. Be, this is not going to be it. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> My mother used to write the obituaries for all the black people in the Potomac Valley, where I grew up halfway between Pittsburgh and D.C., on the Potomac River and the Allegheny Mountains. Mm. And then the colored people, as we would say, when they died, my mother would write their obituary. It would be in our local paper. And then she would read it at the funeral. Before I started school in first grade, I'd get all dressed up and I'd go watch my beautiful mother read these obituary. So I had my father in the oral tradition, my mother in the written tradition. And so storytelling was just a, a, a motto. I was raised to be a doctor, but deep down I wanted to be a storyteller. And it took me a long time until I was in graduate school in England to figure that out. Huh. So when I am listening to people, I really listen to them. I love it. I don't get bored. All of our shoots for Finding Roots last four or five hours. Yeah. And then you see 20 minutes. And I'm walking through people, I'm taking them places they never even knew were on their genealogical map. And a lot of them, they break down, they cry, they, you know, flip out. And um, it's a gift I'm giving to them. It's, they all write in my script book, this is the greatest gift anyone ever gave to me. So it makes me feel like Santa Claus. It makes me feel like I'm blessed that I've been put on the earth to help people find their own um, identities. And that's a gift and a responsibility. And I take it very, very seriously. So it turns me on. I enjoy it and I enjoy sharing those stories. And yes, I wanted, I was, I have a BA from Yale in history and a PhD in English. I didn't, I never studied film, but I'm a movie junkie. I go to movies every weekend. I like going to movies, standing in line, getting popcorn. And I also studied, I started studying hosts on PBS long before I met Paula Kerger, before I ever fantasized about being in front of a camera. And it started with, Kenneth Clark Civilization, and then Jacob Bronowski's The Ascent of Man. And I looked at them and thought, man, if I could only have a job like that and be in front and tell people stories. Mm -hmm. And now I study Simon Shama, Neil Ferguson, whose house I bought, you know, the right wing historian who was a friend of mine. And I bought his house when he moved to Stanford. Um, first thing I did was to knock all the walls down to get all that right wing ideology. <laughs> I was gonna say, did you have to have Sage come through? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. But uh, Ken Burns, I love Ken. We're very good friends. I, I I watch his. He has no bigger fan than I, and I watch to see how he tells a story. He's a genius. Yeah. And and so Stanley Nelson's a very good friend of Stanley, mine. Stanley, oh man. Each each um, documentary filmmaker 
has a signature and like a voice. And I am watching and we try and I try to get better and try to get better. And I think if you look at the, I don't know, I guess we've made 20 documentaries. Each one I think gets better because I'm learning the craft. Um, and also I was trained at Yale. If you don't know something, ask, mm -hmm. don't fake it. That's right. stupid. Right. The power move is to say, I don't know. Or Paula, I need you to explain to me how this works. Or Eric, tell me how this works. Then we we all grow together. And I have great producers and, and every, I insist on something that a lot of hosts apparently don't do. Every day that we shoot, and like reconstruction on the road for three weeks at a time, two weeks at a time, and then you take a break and you go back. Every night, the whole crew and I have dinner. And we go to a nice restaurant, we drink a lot of wine, talk a lot of trash, and we, but we analyze, it's a, it's a trick to get people to relax, to analyze what we've done that day. And then I make them say, okay, what do I do wrong? What can I do better? Well, you could have done this, or what are we doing tomorrow? Because I'm always learning, I'm the student, it's their world, you know? That's awesome. And I'll call Ken sometimes and I'll say, how would you deal with this problem? Or when he was doing Vietnam, which is you know, the greatest documentary series ever created, he invited me up to, you know, I call it um, Ken Burns Estate. You know, he's got like <laughs> this little village up there. And he would show me rough cuts and talk to me about how he did it. I love all that. It's the nuts and bolts of how do you, how do you make a film? And um, I see myself as a student. There you go. And um, I, so, I'm, I'm, I'm growing. So, Paula, I got to hear when you first met this guy. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I kept telling them backstage, I'm going to write a sitcom starring the two of them. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he observed us together for an hour before we came out on stage. And we, we're getting a sitcom out of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I, I met... Coming to Netflix soon. I met, anyway. I met Skip. <laughs> I mean, the PBS. Coming to PBS. I met, <laughs> I met uh, Skip about 25 years ago, and we were introduced by... Uh, a uh, guy who was a member of our board. He was chairman of, of my board when I was in our station in New York. And he knew Skip and said, I have someone that I want to introduce you to that um, I think would be great on public television. And uh, we started working together out of that station. Right. Uh, with the amazing Tammy Robinson, who was our head of programming. An African-American woman is a very good friend, brilliant. Yeah, and uh, fearless and also a teacher. And so uh, it's uh, it's really you know a what journey. He, you know what they told me? She was at... Channel 13 in New York. So I'm in Boston, where WGBH, right? And what they said is, you know, everybody at Harvard thinks that they're a superstar, which is true. You know, they're all waiting for the Nobel Prize to call them, you know, any, any day. And he said, you'll just be one among many if you stay at WGBH. But if you come to New York, you'll be the only Harvard professor there. You'll be a star, you know? And I went like, <laughs> That's a good idea. I mean, that, sounds good. that sounds good. And I moved. All right. Well, it appears that we have reached the end of our time. I could stay here the rest of the evening, but uh, I have a feeling the convention center wouldn't look too kindly on that. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Uh, let's remind everybody when Reconstruction is going to air. April, April 9th. Yep. April 9th. And, and April 16th. 15th. And April 16th. April, not February, which is awesome. So I want you to put your hands together for you know. Paula Kerger <laughs> and Skip Gates. Do you have one other thing you wanted to say? Yeah, of course he does. Of course he does. <laughs> he has one other thing he wants to say. Just one more thing. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say there's one person in the audience uh, whom I met in Paris when her parents were revolutionaries and they were living in exile from the... Um, 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 persecution of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. Mm. Her name is Joju. Joju Cleaver, her mother was Kathleen Cleaver, and her father was Eldridge Cleaver. And she's an educator like you. Jojo, Joju, I love you. And I love all the teachers because I'm one of you. Thank you. Shout out to the so teachers. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Eric Deggins from NPR. Enjoy the rest of the convention. <laughs>